Um, we're we're going to continue in our series in the Gospel of Mark this morning, entitled The King's Mark of Love. And excited to do that. And I want to thank you for encouraging Carter, uh, who did a good job last week bringing God's Word to us. And, and several weeks ago, Chris uh, did a good job bringing God's Word to us, and he he preached about a storm that the disciples faced in a boat. And we're going to see another storm this morning that the disciples face in a boat. But before we do that, uh, I want to pray together. Let's, let's continue to ask for God's help uh, to move in this time. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come together and to worship you together. Uh, the, the psalmist wrote that the unfolding of your words gives light, that it imparts understanding to the simple. And so we pray this morning that you, Holy Spirit, would work powerfully through me and in our hearts as, as we look at the word together and as we, we ask you to unfold it so that we might see you, Jesus, increasingly as, as who you are, as great and glorious and powerful uh, that it's already been prayed this morning that you might stir up affections in our hearts for you, Jesus, that we might see you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you do that and work mightily in our midst now. And I pray for protection from distractions uh, as, as we come and open your word together, and as we worship over your word. Would you protect this time and move powerfully in it? Uh, we need your help, and we want to cooperate with what you want to do in this time. And so lead us now, I pray. In Jesus' precious and powerful name, and all the people who wanted that said, amen, amen. Um, well, I want to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, and as you're doing that, um, I want to share a video with you. In, in June of 2011, uh, a meteorologist for the CBS affiliate in Richmond, Virginia, sh shared this really interesting forecast, and so I wonder if we could get that video to work. It's... It's quite interesting. We had beautiful weather here for this weekend, mostly sunny skies and highs in the upper 80s. Overnight tonight, partly cloudy, mild, with those temperatures dropping down into the mid 70s. Now we've got some big changes here for the upcoming work week starting tomorrow. We're going to have a volcanic eruption right near Charlottesville, and it's going to make things rather toasty across the area. We're going to see lava spill out into central Virginia and make temperatures in Richmond at 350 degrees, Fredericksburg at 345. Charlottesville, the hot spot at 400, not as hot off towards the tidewater. A little bit more comfortable with highs near 100 degrees. The reason why we're going to have tidal waves moving in ahead of this, a global superstorm developing off towards the Atlantic Ocean. This thing is headed our way, but the key to the forecast right before this thing makes landfall, it is going to be deflected by Godzilla. Now, a lot can change between now and then. We're looking at the latest data. We'll continue to bring you the very latest. I do want to encourage you, though, that if you ever do see a sleeping coyote, do not wake it. Bad idea. Okay, here's the forecast. Volcano 350 there for Monday. Global superstorm on Tuesday. We could see maybe about 1, 200 inches of rainfall, wind gusts up to 1,000 miles an hour. Godzilla Wednesday. And I'll be honest, I have no idea what's going to happen on that day. After that, though, how about this to finish off the work week? Low humidity, lots of sunshine, with highs in the upper 80s heading into next weekend. <laughs> this is a real CBS affiliate that put this together. Um, I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really thankful for the technology that meteorologists have to help us prep for storms. But many of us have experienced... Uh, hearing about a storm, and we rush out, and we buy all kinds of stuff. And, and then we, we get home, and it ends up just being a dusting of snow. Anybody? Ma many times, yeah. Yeah, where was all the snow? And other times, we don't hear anything about a storm, and then all of a sudden, there was a foot and a half of snow, and we're stuck, and we think, well, what happened? Uh, that happened here a couple of years ago. And we've been conditioned a little bit. Uh, especially like three to five days out from a storm to be uncertain of what a storm is going to do. Uh, just that the longer you live, you kind of get conditioned that way. And this kind of weather conditioning is connected to the uncertainty that we feel in the storms of life. Uh, we, we enter storms with great uncertainty, not knowing what's happening, and probably most importantly, not knowing what Jesus is doing. I know some of us here have faced storms recently, Physical health, spiritual, 
relational, parenting, financial, mental health, work storms. Uh, many, of, many of us have faced storms. And while meteorologists are really helpful, it is not an exact science. They're just putting forth their best estimates of a storm. And, and what we see in our text this morning is that Jesus is more than a meteorologist in our storms. That'd be a good spot for an amen. Jesus is more than a meteorologist in our storms. And so I want to look together at Mark 6. We're going to close out the chapter beginning at verse 45. Mark 6 and verse 45. And Mark, and Mark starts with his, his word, his famous word in verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. So remember what has just happened. Carter shared about the feeding of the 5,000, which was more like the feeding of twenty to 25,000 people. So you have this huge group of people that's just kind of hanging around. And Jesus is, what we see in the text is that he's very active in directing people places. He makes the disciples get in a boat. He dismisses the crowd. And it's a little odd you know, as you think about such a great, amazing miracle, and the disciples and the people are there, and they're likely just kind of radiating in what just happened. This is amazing. Jesus' power is on display. Why, why would Jesus so quickly dismiss them? R.C. Sproul was, was really helpful on this. He says, we know that occasionally when Jesus, he, Jesus, performed a significant miracle, particularly when large crowds were present, the people would begin to press on him wanting to anoint him as their king, looking to him to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. And Jesus didn't come to lead a political rebellion for people. He had come to die for people. And as soon as this miracle takes place, Jesus makes his disciples get into the boat. And there's, there's force in this language that Mark uses in verse 45. He made them get into the boat. They, they may be, kind of like you got to make your six-year-old go to bed at night. Judah, it's time for bed. He made them get into the boat. Um, and notice, notice the course that Jesus gives the disciples in verse 45. Where are they headed? Somebody shout it out. Where are they headed? Across the sea. Beside it. Yep, yep. And Jesus is, is very intentional about this. And it's an important detail. Jesus, Jesus is more than a meteorologist in our storms. And we... We see so many verbs in this text to demonstrate the activity of Jesus in our storms. God wants us to see them together. So Jesus is active. Jesus is active. Here's the first way he's active. He prays for us in our storms. He prays for us in our storms. If you're taking notes, that's the first point. And he says in, in verse 46, after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. So Jesus has sent his disciples on their way very intentionally, and then he heads up the mountain to pray. And we don't know exactly what this prayer time sounded like, but we know that Jesus prays for his disciples. Uh, he tells us that. John 17, 9, I think we've got it up on the screen there. He says, I'm, I'm praying for them. I, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And it's such a blessing to have uh, people praying for us. Uh, someone maybe comes up to you on a Sunday morning and, and says, I, I don't know what your week has been like, but God led me to pray for you this week. Um, several people have done that with me. It's been a great blessing. Many of you do that for one another. As, as encouraging as it is, though, to have someone in the church praying for us, it's even more encouraging to know that Jesus is praying for us. This, this is his very heart. Look at Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Look at this. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for them. Burkhoff, Louis Burkhoff in his systematic text wrote this, that it's a consoling thought that Christ, oh, that's small. Listen carefully. That Christ is praying for us. Even when we are negligent in our prayer life, that he is presenting to the Father those spiritual needs which were not present to our minds and which we oft, often neglect to include in our prayers, and that he prays for our protection against the dangers of which we are not even conscious and against the enemies which threaten us, though we do not notice it. 
he is praying that our faith may not cease and that we may come out victoriously in the end. So here, here's the question as we begin this morning. How, how might the storm that you're facing right now seem different if you reflected on this reality that Jesus is praying for the specifics of the situation right now? He's praying for the people involved. He's praying for your heart in the midst of the storm. Do we believe this? Do we believe this, that Jesus is praying like this for us? Do we believe that he lives, as Hebrews 7.25 says, to make intercession for you? Do we believe this? Robert Murray McShane famously quoted as saying, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Jesus is actively praying for us in the middle of storms. He's actively praying for us in the middle of storms. Jesus is active. Here's the second point, that he, he sees us in our storms. He sees us in our storms. Look at verse 47. And, and when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he, somebody give me that word, saw, and he saw that they were making headway, somebody give me that word, painfully, right, for the wind was against them. So remember the position that Jesus is in here, he's up on the mountain, he's up on the mountain literally, and he can see where the boat pushed off, it's the Sea of Galilee, so it's not huge, uh, it's, it's a lot smaller than Lake Superior, like it's, it's a smaller body of water, and he can, he can see where they're, where they're headed, and the disciples experience some difficulty. Um, our Kent Hughes says the disciples had dutifully set out for their destination, but a wind had come howling from the northeast, driving them out to the middle of the lake. John was specific about this. They were about three to three and a half miles out. John 6, 19. Uh, the wind had blown them away from their northwest destination, though they had been struggling for seven to eight hours to get there. The sails were down, the oars were out, and they were literally driving at the oars. Despite their strenuous rowing, they were not getting closer but farther away. So this is an intense situation. He, he describes it, the way they were making headway, as painfully. Um, painfully means a, a kind of tormenting strain. Um, the word in Greek here is used to describe demon possession in Mark 5, hell in Revelation 14, and childbirth in Revelation 12. Um, also, thank you, moms. Uh, thank you, moms. Um, but it, it communicates a picture of, of our struggle in, in storms. Like This is a real struggle for the disciples. And, and we go through real struggles just like this, that, that in storms that produce real pain. And I hope, I really hope this is just as encouraging to you as it, as it was to me this week as I studied it, that Jesus sees our pain in storms. He sees our pain. He sees it. Jason Meyer says, Mark does not simply tell us what is happening with the disciples. He explicitly tells us that Jesus sees it. When Jesus sees things, he does not turn a blind eye to them. This is the very heart of God on display. Jesus can see everything. And when we're in a weather-related storm, it's hard for us to see. We were trying to drive last Thursday, get back to our house in the downpour that we, could ha that we had, and I had to slow down. I could barely see 100 feet in front of me. It was really, really raining. And that's how it is for us in storms of life as well. It's just it's hard to see in the middle of storms. It's like I can't, I can't see tomorrow. I can barely see this afternoon. It's hard for us to see in storms, but Jesus can see in a storm. He can see us in our storms. And what's so comforting is that he can see beyond our storms as well. He can see beyond our storms to what's on the other side of them. And so many of us, when we get into the middle of storms, we think, well, Jesus, do you even see what I'm going through? 
And one of the consistent arrows of the enemy, I'm, I'm sure many in this room have experienced this, is that this, you're totally alone in this. You're totally alone. No one else has ever experienced anything else like this. No one understands. No one cares. Even God doesn't care or doesn't see. And we can easily buy into this, does anyone care lie? It's really easy. R. Kent Hughes says that the human tendency during difficulty is to imagine the face of God with blind eyes. But our text teaches just the opposite, that followers of Christ in the storms are special objects of his omniscient, compassionate care. Jesus sees you and your pain. He sees you and your pain. Right now, how might that shift what you were experiencing if, if you believed and you knew that Jesus sees you and your pain? Jesus sees and he cares. It gets better. Jesus is active. Here's the third point. He comes to us in our storms. He comes to us in our storms. And verse 48 says, And about the fourth watch of the night. So this is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Oofta, those are tough hours. Um, and to be out on a boat in a storm at those hours would be really tough. So it's about between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Verse 48 says, He came to them. So Jesus is up on the mountain. But he doesn't just stay there watching them in the storm. Could, could Jesus have done something about the storm the disciples were in from up on the mountain? Could he have done something? Yes, absolutely. He can do the same thing for our storms, too. From a distance, he could do something about it. But, but he often chooses not to do that so that he can walk down into the storm with us. And Mark tells us in verse 48 that Jesus comes to them in the middle of the storm. He, he lives to show himself strong for us. He's not scared or intimidated or put off by the storm or, or our inability to navigate it. He's willing and able to step in and to meet us with a purpose in the middle of a storm. And look at how he comes to them, verse 48. He's, he says, walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. And as we read this account, Dave and I were talking about it earlier this morning, you might, you might realize what well, it seems like as we're reading this, there's maybe a detail that's left out from this account as we read the other Gospels. Um, Matthew 14 includes this detail that, that Peter was walking on the water in this situation. That Actually, Peter, um, he gets out of the boat, walks on the water to Jesus, is doing pretty good for a little bit, and then takes his eyes off Jesus onto the waves, and he sinks, and Jesus brings him back up again. Why does Mark leave this out? Where did Mark get most of his info from? Peter. Peter doesn't want the attention to be on himself, but on Jesus. And so he leaves, he leaves this out of this account, and what Mark shares with us next is a bit, of, a bit confusing at first glance. Look, keep looking at verse 48. <clears throat> uh, verse 48 says, he, he meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. Uh, the Greek word for ghost is phantasma. It's where we get our word to describe the guy running around the opera. Phantom. There you go. You got it. You got it. Um, the point is that the disciples, didn't, they didn't recognize him. And some commentators put forth some really interesting ideas as to what this means. Like, he, he meant to pass by, but he just couldn't. I mean, is this a game of hide-and-seek, uh, hide-and-seek tag? I mean, what, is Jesus trying to scare them, and they caught him? Whoops, gotcha. Like, like what, what is happening here? Um, it's a bit perplexing. And this, this principle of perspicuity is really important, that we need to let Scripture interpret Scripture, especially where it seems confusing. So Jesus is connecting this moment to a couple of key moments 
if you've, if you've zoned out, pay attention here now, because this is really important. He's connecting this moment to a couple of key moments that happened in Old Testament history, where servants were exhausted and were suffering. In Exodus 33, Moses is exhausted. He's led the people uh, across the Red Sea, out of Egypt, and he can see that God's people are a really tough crew to lead. They're obstinate. It's exhausting for him to lead them. And what's interesting is that Moses himself is up on a mountain talking with God. And Moses says, I don't, I don't know that I can do this. I don't know that I can do this. And, and God says in Exodus thirty three fourteen, this scripture that I wear around my wrist on my right arm, my presence will be with you. I will give you rest. And then Moses asked God to show him his glory. And like a, a scene from A Few Good Men, God says, you can't handle my glory in its fullness. <laughs> so he tucks him into this protected spot in a rock, and what does he do? Passes by. Exodus 34, 6, it's up on the screen. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And here's, here's what happens in Exodus. By God bringing his presence before Moses, he gives him life and encouragement. This was powerful for Moses. Moses comes down off the mountain and is able to fulfill the rest of his call. God passing by in his glory, not all of his glory, and some of his glory is powerful for Moses. Another person this happened to is Elijah. First uh, Kings 18. We read about this triumphant scene in this showdown. Uh, God showing his power. But then in First Kings 19, Elijah is completely depressed and exhausted from the storm that he's in. Because of Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel was an evil controlling queen, and Elijah is, is in a storm because Jezebel wants Elijah to be murdered. And he takes a nap and gets something to eat. God directs him to do that, two things that often help, amen? Take a nap and get something to eat. That's good. Maybe a good Sunday afternoon thing to do. Um, but they didn't help for Elijah. And so 1 Kings 19.8 says, He went in the strength of that food, of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. So Elijah goes up on a mountain. He goes up on a mountain. He talks with God. He says he doesn't, Elijah doesn't want to live anymore. He's despairing for his life. And God comes down and passes by Elijah. And Elijah gets to experience God passing by. And it helps Elijah to come down off the mountain and to be faithful to keep doing what God has called him to do. See, Jesus passing by uh, any of us is meant to give us rejuvenation in life as we behold who he is as our God. There's a connection between our, our fear in a storm and God showing us his glory. The word glory in Hebrew means weightiness. Right? The, the weightiness to the glory of God is meant to silence our fear as our fear shifts from whatever thing that we're afraid of to him. Um, Proverbs says that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we have the right understanding of who God is in the middle of a storm, it will seem much less weighty to us and we will be energized by who God is, by his glory as our God. He wants to create a great big view within us of who he is. Jesus comes and he, and he passes by here to show his glory. And he comes to pass by us to show us his glory. And just like the prophets, Jesus is up on a mountain talking with God. God passes by the prophets on the mountain in their storms. But Jesus comes down off the mountain to pass by his people in the middle of our storms. Jesus is, is active. He, he prays. He sees. He comes. And here's, here's the point four. He speaks to us in our storms. He speaks to us in our storms. Look at verse 50. Here's Mark's word again. 
Uh, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So he, he tells them not to be afraid, but he says just what he says before that is really important. Uh, it is I. Um, I'm a huge fan of the ESV translation, um, but there's some meaning here in the Greek that doesn't come through in the English translation. In Greek, there's a semantic range of meaning, and we look to the context, and we look to case endings to help understand. And the, the words in Greek here are ego imi, which can mean it is I, but also means I am, which is God's name. Can we go back to Moses for one moment? Can we? Yeah, can we? How are we doing? Can, can, we, can we go back to Moses for a moment? So uh, Moses, uh, in Exodus 3, verse 13, Moses says to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, that I am has sent me to you. I am who I am, God describing himself. And when the, the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, was translated, the words ego imi were used for I am. And when Jesus makes each of his I am statements in the Gospel of John, he uses this language and we see it right here in Mark 6, too. Jesus comes down off a mountain. He walks on water. He looks them in the face, and he says, I am. I am. And here's the big idea this morning. That I am is active in the storm I am in. I am is active in the storm I am in. In the middle of storms, we need to tune into the voice of God telling us who he is. To tune out other voices informing us about the storm. It's so important for us to still ourselves in his presence so that we can, we can listen to him tell us who he is. I am is active in the storm that I am in. If I can encourage you pastorally to be able to get quiet, it's, I know it's so hard in the middle of storms, but to be able to get quiet so that we can hear Jesus clearly, to, to get time with him, to hear him inform us of who he is. I am is active in the storm I am in. Jesus is active. Here's the fifth point. He joins us in our storms. And, and he got, this verse 51, and he got into the boat with them. Got into the boat with them. Uh, Rich Mullins uh, wrote a song a number of years ago, and I couldn't help but think of it this week as I was at this point in studying. Uh, the lyrics were, hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaken like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Rich Mullins fans, yes. Yes. So Jesus tries to pass by. They don't get it. Jesus speaks to them. They don't get it. Finally, he says, hey, I'll just get in the boat with you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we're a lot like the disciples sometimes. Um, we don't get it. I, I, I forget where I read this this week, but God's presence is meant to empower our persistence in storms. His presence with us is meant to empower our persistence in storms. And look at what happens as he gets in the boat with them. Verse 51, and the wind did what? What did it do? It ceased, right? I, I'm just going to geek out about the Bible for just a couple of minutes. I'm just warning you. Can we do that together? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, so the book of Job was written uh, hundreds of years before Jesus steps on the scene. Job 9.8, speaking of God. I think we got it up on the screen there. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. <laughs> and Mark writes, Mark writes in verse 51 that the, the disciples were utterly astounded for they did not understand about 
the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And utterly astounded, by the way, is, is not a positive statement. Uh, this is not faith. <laughs> um, they didn't know what they were witnessing or who they were witnessing. Mark says their hearts were what? Hardened. And uh, we looked at Job 9.8 just a second ago, God trampling the waves of the sea. But, but look at Job 9.11. <laughs> Behold, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. The Bible is fascinating. <laughs> um, the disciples, they miss the point. They miss the point. And our, our Ken Hughes says that Mark even tells us why they did not get it. Their hearts were hard. When people fail to understand the identity of Christ, it's not because they are unintelligent. It's because their hearts are recalcitrant. Their hearts are made out of stone, for sin has caused great calluses to grow on their hearts so that Christ himself could walk in front of them on the water, and they still would not believe. The disciples did not get it when Jesus fed the 5,000. They did not get it when he walked on the water. They did not get it when he called himself a going me. They, they did not get it when he stepped into the boat and the wind died. Their hearts were hardened. Thankfully, Jesus was not finished with them yet. Soon there was more evidence for them to see. But, but the point here is really clear from the text that if our hearts are hardened to who Jesus is, it will be nearly impossible to see his activity in the storm. If our hearts are hard toward Jesus, if we don't get who Jesus is, we won't get what he's doing. We won't see his activity. And there's one other really profound connection here to the Old Testament if you think back on Psalm 23 and these pictures that David describes of the good shepherd caring for us, and we sang about the good shepherd this morning. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I want you to think back on Mark 6. Green grass, feeding of the 5,000. He leads me beside stilled waters. Mark 6, stilled waters. Storm on the sea. Jesus at the end of Mark 6 is as the good shepherd acting out these pictures from Psalm 23. He wants them to know him in this way as the good shepherd. I am is active in the storm I am in. I am is active in the storm I am in. Jesus is, is active. He prays. He sees. He comes. He speaks. He joins and here's the last point. He uses our storms. He uses our storms. And look at verse 53. <clears throat> when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. Who remembers? I, I had you point this out earlier. Where did Jesus have them headed before? Verse 45. Be Bethsaida, right? Right? Where, where did they end up? We just read it. Gennesaret. It's quite a few miles from Bethsaida. Uh, Jesus uses storms to, to change where they were headed. He uses this storm to change where they were headed. And he uses storms like this in our lives, too, to lead, to lead us to places to serve. That's where the disciples ended up, with Jesus in a place in need of ministry. And Jesus often allows us to pass through storms to bring us to where we need to be, to give us an opportunity to hold on to him in a way that we haven't before, to, to shape us, to sanctify us. God takes these storms and uses them to fit us for ministry. And you've maybe, you've maybe experienced someone trying to walk with you in a storm, maybe well-meaning. And it was just was really apparent that they had not experienced much brokenness in their life, or that maybe they weren't willing to admit it. Just slapping Bible verses on things, and you could just tell there was hardly any brokenness that they had experienced. It's not super helpful most of the time. But when someone walks with you who has been broken by storms that God has walked them through, powerful ministry happens. My dad shared a book with me this week called A Tale of Three Kings, and it, it traces the 12 years of God's work between David's anointing as king until he actually becomes king. And how God was, 
was fitting him for ministry to lead in a different way than King Saul had led. He didn't want another king like King Saul. So he works in David's life in this way. And God, God fits us for ministry through storms and the resulting brokenness too. That's where sweet humility comes. And it's what he did with the disciples and, and it's what he does with us too. I've had the privilege to walk with some folks in this church through some really challenging situations in the last uh, year. And I, I just encourage them. God, God is bearing fruit in their lives at a clip they have probably never experienced before. And we often miss it because we think fruit can't be born in a storm. But as I read, read the Bible, the fruit that I see God most often bearing is in the lives of the disciples in the midst of storms. <laughs> Not in the midst of things looking great on the surface. God bears some of his greatest fruit in us in the midst of storms. Verse 54, and, and when they, they got out of the boat, people immediately recognized him. And ran, verse 55, and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. So it's, it's quite the contrast here. As you think back on the last point, the, the disciples think Jesus is a ghost, right? Phantasma. And yet when he gets to the shore at Gennesaret, and we don't know that he's ever been here before, I don't believe at this point, those who are sick and needy immediately do what? They recognize him. Just something to draw out here that the hardness of heart and entitled religious people often miss the work of Jesus and needy people know him when they see him. Entitled religious people put God in a box and they demand him to work on their terms and they often miss him. But needy people are willing to receive Jesus as he comes to them. Do we see him? Do we see him? Verse 56, and wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as, as many as touched it were made well, the, the fringes on the garments were to remind the people of God walking with them in their lives to help them walk in his ways. Numbers 15 speaks of this. And so as they're touching Jesus' garments, it's a reminder that God, God is with them to help them. I am is active in the storm. I am in. Band, would you, would you come? And you might be, you might be in a storm today and well, I think this is true for, for many of us. I mean, the way that we picture God <clears throat> dealing with the storm is by just removing it. That's what we pray typically. Just take it, take it away. Sometimes he does that. But I want to encourage you to be encouraged by Jesus' presence with you and activity for you in the midst of the storm. To think through the ways in which Jesus, maybe we can do that right now, just even in the next minute or two, all, just to think through the ways in which Jesus may have been praying for you, coming to you, speaking to you, joining you, and using this storm in your life. I am as active in the storm I am in. We're going to partake in communion together. and Jesus coming down off the mountain to get in the boat for you. We saw it this morning, but Jesus goes to the cross to get in the boat with you to ultimately defeat your greatest enemy, which was sin and death. And he gives his body to be broken which is what the bread represents in his blood to be shed, which is what the juice represents for you and for me. Jesus comes to us, and he gives himself for us. And so I want to encourage you. We're a, we're a church. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in communion together this morning. You just need to know Jesus as your Savior. But in a special way, as we partake in the elements this morning, I just want to encourage you to be reminded of Jesus and his activity in the middle of our storms for us and in the middle of our greatest storm, which he went to the cross for us. Would you pray with me? Father, I, <clears throat> I'm just so grateful for the sending of the Son to come 
and to die a death in our place that we deserve to die. Jesus, thank you for allowing your body to be broken and your blood to be shed for us. We might have forgiveness of sins. And, and you said that we, we, as often as we do this, this morning as we come before the table, that we proclaim your death until you, you come again. And so we do that this morning as we come before the table and we partake in the elements. But I pray in a special way as we just walk through this text in Mark 6 that, that we'd be reminded of your activity in our lives specifically, that as we bite down on the bread and taste the juice, that we might be reminded of your activity in the midst of the storms that we face, how you, how you pray for us, how you see us, how you come to us, how you, you speak to us, how you use what we're going through to fit us for ministry. Thank you. Thank you for your work for us. Holy Spirit, would you lead us now as we seek to, to delight in you increasingly, Jesus, in this moment as we remember your sacrifice for us. We love you. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.